In this video, we're going to learn about controllability after sampling. <clears throat> so we've already learned in this course how there are continuous time systems. So those continuous time systems are in the structure x of t dot equals a x of t plus b u of t or discrete time systems that are of the form x at sample k plus 1, or x at the next sample, is equal to a times x at this sample plus b times u at this sample. <clears throat> so continuous time systems truly evolve continuously in time, and discrete time systems really only exist at these updates. So you can think of the state at sample 1 and the state at sample 2, and they're doesn't even exist the notion of the states in between the samples. <clears throat> now we've learned controllability tests, whether that's to form a controllability matrix or it's to form a Jordan form equivalent and look at that structure. And we've seen that the tests for controllability of these two systems are <clears throat> almost identical to each other. So there's one more type of system that's actually the most important system that we deal with as engineers, and that's the sample data system. The sample data system begins with a true continuous time physical system and then it somehow controls that using some sort of computer or microcontroller with a fixed sampling period t. And that sampling period t is commonly something like one millisecond, for example. But basically, we're going to only be able to read our sensors from our continuous time system every t seconds and we're going to only be able to update our inputs that we're going to send to that system every t seconds and then we're going to hold that input constant over the course of that next input with a sample and hold operation usually from some d to a converter and what we do is we turn this into an equivalent discrete system where that discrete a looks like e to the a t. So we literally take our continuous time a matrix, we multiply it by our sampling period t, that creates a new matrix that's the same size as a, and we take the matrix exponential of it, and that's how we form the discrete a matrix of this sample data system. For the discrete b matrix, what we do is we integrate the effect of holding that u constant over that one sampling period. So we we evaluate it over just one sampling period, for, like for example for one millisecond, and what we integrate is this e to the a t operation, but now we're integrating over the continuous time t for that period, and then this whole thing gets multiplied by the continuous b matrix. So this is how we take a continuous time system with a sampling period t and convert it into a discrete time system. But unlike the real discrete time system in which the states didn't exist between samples, in the, in the sample data system they really do exist between samples, we just don't see them. So if I think about plotting my, my states versus time, I really do have some sort of continuous time system that I'm only looking at periodically with my sensors. But the signals really do exist between the samples. And so the question is, do the controllability, in a, or excuse me, just controllability results, we're not thinking about observability here at all, do the controllability results hold that we've already learned for these two systems? And the answer is almost, not quite. So how we think about controllability in sample data systems is we first think about our continuous time system. This is our real physical system we're trying to control. And we say, is this system controllable? The continuous time system. If it is not controllable, then sampling it with a computer and losing information isn't going to somehow make it magically controllable. The sampling can only make it worse because we're losing our ability to control it between the samples. So the first thing you do is you look at your continuous time system and say, is this pair A, B controllable? If it is controllable, you're on the right path. It seems like you have enough actuators to control your system for its dynamics. But the question is, did I somehow hurt that controllability by sampling it? 
and you can hurt it. So what we're going to learn is a sufficient condition of something you can do to ensure that you don't hurt that controllability of the continuous time system by sampling it. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to think about how we could possibly hurt our controllability. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine I'm going to imagine a system that has um, an eigenvalue, a pair of complex eigenvalues. So lambda one equals some real number plus and minus some imaginary number. So this is a complex eigenvalue, and the real part is responsible for the sort of the envelope of the response. So let's I'm going to draw the dynamic, the natural response of my system here. And it's got some sort of some sort of envelope. And this has a time constant, tau. And this real part is basically 1 over tau with a minus sign. So we're assuming here that a is a negative number and tau is a positive number. Then the imaginary component is what we call the damped natural frequency. That's the actual frequency that you will see the natural response of your system have in units of radians per second. So if I start with an initial condition here for this thing, I'll see some sort of time response that looks like an oscillation that exists between these, these decaying envelopes. Now, what if I had in my system another set of complex eigenvalues? And those had a very similar uh, imaginary set of numbers, but the, the, the imaginary number was twice the imaginary number of last time. So if I just coincidentally had eigenvalues that were structured like this, what I would see is this next system's dynamic response would have the same envelope, but it would have twice the oscillation frequency. So what would happen if I started from the same place is I would oscillate two times for every one time the other one oscillated. Now, <clears throat> let's say I sampled here, so I knew where I started, and these two eigenvalues both started in the same place. And let's say just coincidentally, the next time I sampled, so my capital T, the next time I sampled was right here. So this, this first set of states oscillated like whoop to there, the next set of states oscillated woo, 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 boom, but I didn't see any of that because that all happened between samples. So when these, when I actually sampled, these two sets of states looked identical to me. So this is a case where when I go back and looked at my, my controllability in my continuous time, particularly if you think about doing it in the Jordan form, you can go back and watch the Jordan form video of controllability. You know, what my system saw when it said it was controllable is it basically said, I can distinguish these dynamics from these dynamics. But when I went to a sample data system, all of a sudden I can't, I can't distinguish those anymore because I lose the information in between samples and at the samples those two happen to look um, identical to each other. And for me to conjure up these examples, I mean, think about what I did. I made, I made the natural frequency, or excuse me, the damped natural frequency of the oscillation of these eigenvalues to be exactly twice that of the other. But you can, if you think about what I did, I could have done it three times faster or four times faster. Um, and so, and it also was important that my sampling period T was, a, was kind of a perfect interval of that information. So this is the way, this is I'm trying to explain sort of an intuitive way of how you can lose controllability information through sampling. You start with a continuous time system that passed the controllability test. Basically, you said, I can somehow see, control these dynamics differently from these dynamics. But now through sampling, you've lost so much information that they don't seem different to you anymore. So now, how do we generalize that result for any system without conjuring up these sort of anecdotal examples. And the way we generalize those is we say if the real part 
of eigenvalue i and eigenvalue j, excuse me, j, if the real part is equal to zero. So what is, first of all, what does this mean? If the real part of eigenvalue one minus eigenvalue two equals zero, that's another way of saying that the real part of eigenvalue one and eigenvalue two are the same as each other. So like up here, they were both a, a and a. So when I subtract them, they go to zero. So we're only talking about now cases like I've conjured up here where the real parts are the same. They're the only ones we have to be worrying about in this case. So if they are the same, what do we have to do to ensure something like this doesn't happen? So if this is true, then what we need to do to make sure our system stays controllable is we need to ensure that the imaginary part, the imaginary part of eigenvalue i minus eigenvalue j, and actually we don't care about the imaginary part in total, we only care about the absolute value of the imaginary part. We don't care if, if it's plus or minus. We need to make sure that this thing is never equal to 2 pi over t times m for any m equal to 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. So basically, m can be any integer number starting at 1 and going up. You don't ever want these this thing to be true. If this thing is true, then um, then you will have some case like this where you're sampling and you're losing information. So this is a check that you do. You say, if my continuous time system is controllable, I look at the eigenvalues. If any of the eigenvalues have the same real part, then I look at the imaginary parts of those eigenvalues. And if those eigenvalues uh, ever have this happen, then you are going to lose your controllability. And the way that you solve it, basically, is you pick a different t. So, for example, <clears throat> you might say, my microcontroller is fast enough to run so that t is one millisecond. But just totally coincidentally, based on my system's dynamics, that one millisecond causes me to lose controllability after I sample it. So I can actually force my microcontroller to run slower and say, what if instead of running at one millisecond, uh, or one millisecond update rate, what if I ran it at a, like a 1.5 millisecond update rate or a 1.1 millisecond update rate? Would that solve this problem? So you intentionally slow down your sampling to make sure you don't lose your controllability due to this problem. Um, and that's the way we handle controllability with sampling.